It's time to start. 6.31. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> We're ready. Do we have lights? <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Mic on. My name is Kim Hill. I'm the superintendent here in Charles County Public Schools. And the first thing that I would like to do is to thank you all for coming out for tonight's dialogue about school safety and security. Uh, we are going to give you a short presentation. We're going to try to keep that presentation to within 25 to 30 minutes to update you on the things that we've been doing to address safety and security in our schools. And then we're going to open things up to our, our audience, in-person audience here, as well as our online audience out in the Twitter sphere to take your questions and to hear your comments and suggestions regarding school safety in Charles County Public Schools. Um, I think one thing we will all agree on right away is that school safety is important. And it's something that we at Charles County Public Schools have been focused on for quite a long time. And so we, we value your opinions and your questions and we look forward to having that dialogue with you tonight. As someone who's lived in Charles County since 1976, I can tell you that we live in a great community. And one of the reasons that we have such a great community is the partnerships that we have between major organizations in the community. So I want to introduce a few people who are here with us tonight and give them the recognition that they deserve and the work that they do on behalf of all of us in Charles County Public Schools. So the first person that I would like to recognize and thank is Delegate Susie Proctor for being here. Delegate Proctor, thank you so much. And then we have hardworking members of the elected Board of Education who are with us tonight. We have Chair Barbara Palco, <laughs> Vice Chair Jennifer Abel, and then Board Members Virginia McGraw, Victoria Kelly, and Mike Lucas. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Also, if you were here a little bit early, you got to see the scrolling PowerPoint slides that were rolling as you came in and found your seats. And on, that, on those slides, we had members of our <coughs> School Safety Advisory Council. So back last April, we decided to pull together a group of community members to work with us on school safety, to advise us to take a Is look at what we're doing, to, to talk with us about gaps, to give us suggestions, to take a look at our facilities, to take a look at our technology, lots of different areas. And many members of our School Safety Advisory Council are here with us tonight. If you all are in the, on the School Safety Advisory Council, could please stand and turn around and wave to the audience and be recognized. Scrolling PowerPoint, and we'll make sure it's available on uh, whatever video evidence we have of this meeting tonight. Take a look at the credentials of these folks. These are folks who are experts in their field, whether it's mental health, security, safety, procedures, cyber, right in our own community, who have volunteered to be with us uh, in working on school safety and security. And so we met as late as last night to, again, go over everything that we're doing. So all of you folks who volunteer your time, I know I don't pay you too much, I don't pay anything at all, but thank you very, very much for the time and your expertise. Because we are educators, and we believe we're doing the right things for our children, but it always is nice to have experts in fields take a look and give us that outside affirmation that yes, we are doing the right thing. Also, is Commissioner Amanda Stewart here? Commissioner Stewart, <coughs> welcome. Thank you so much. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate you being here. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is go through a very quick set of slides to give you some background on what we're doing already in Charles County Public Schools. And we promise not to take too long because we know you want to ask questions and we want to hear your, your, your questions and your comments. 
I'm glad but we get what I want everyone today. in our community to know, whether you're, you're here with us yeah. tonight or whether you're online me? and watching through uh, through video, is that school safety is not new to Charles County Public Schools. It has always been job one. If we don't have safe and secure schools, we cannot teach and students cannot learn. So the top section of this slide really kind of outlines, and I promise not to read everything to you, it outlines things that were already in place. Security cameras, a great uh, relationship with the Charles County Sheriff's Office, a school re resource program that is a model in the nation. We've had here in Charles County Public Schools for years. The governor of Maryland has just put forth and, and put into law some regulations asking other school districts to make sure they have a school resource officer at every high school. Charles County Public Schools has had that in place at high schools and middle schools for years. So you should feel very, very good about that. I know that we do. You can see the other the technology pieces that we put in place, access controls, lock down the exterior doors. We've trained our staff in, in appropriate reactions to uh, incidents on campus. And for many, many years, we focused on the value of relationships. Because I don't Reading care how many hardened facilities we have, if we don't have great relationships between our staff and our students, then we don't have a safe environment. Because from working in, a, in school buildings for almost 32 years now, I can tell you the kids almost always know when things are going to happen. And if we've got a culture and a climate in our schools where students are also taking ownership of safety in our buildings, then we can take care of problems before they become major. I don't know how to put this any more than just say it the way it is. Uh, an incident at Stoddart with an employee, an ex-employee, who did very, very inappropriate, unimaginable things uh, to some of our students changed our world, changed our world. So as a good a job as we thought we were doing with school safety and security, once that incident happened, all bets were off. We took a whole new, fresh look at school safety and security and layered on top what we were already doing, the items you see there. We created with the support of the members of our Board of Education an Office of School Safety and Security, where we have hired a director with tremendous experience, and he'll be talking with you in a minute, in law enforcement and crime prevention and incident command, etc. We've created a whole, the School Safety Advisory Council, which I've already talked with you about a little bit, and their input has been invaluable. And finally, that focus on relationships will never go away, because that really is the key to having a great school climate. So with that, I'm going to ask each of our team members who are on the panel here to quickly go through the slides they would like to present with you. And then we will open it up to questions and I'll give you some direction after we're finished with this portion so that we can make sure that not everyone is standing online to ask questions all at once. Okay? Mr. Stoddard. Good evening, everybody. It's an honor to sit in front of you. My name is Jason Stoddard. I'm the newly selected Director of Safety and Security for the Charles County Public School System. I come to you after spending 20 and a half years with the Charles County Sheriff's Office where I retired as a lieutenant and in charge of our uh, Homeland Security and Intelligence <clears throat> Unit. I would like to recognize my replacement, Lieutenant Chris Schmidt, who happens to join us this evening um, uh, to come out and to listen to also what we're doing. Uh, as you can see on the slide, we're going to go over a few things. What includes the Office of Safety and Security? Uh, I work in concert with Mr. Mike Heim, who seated directly, who seated directly to my left, uh, to consult with physical security issues. Uh, I'm also in charge of our emergency management program. So that includes writing policies and procedures and examining exactly what we do on a regular basis when we respond to events or to prevent events with inside of our school system. I also am in charge of uh, our newly created background section and internal affairs section. Over the last uh, six months, we've hired two <coughs> internal affairs detectives. Um, they're both joining us today. They're seated at stage right. The first one is retired sergeant uh, from Baltimore City, who is a homicide <coughs> detective, is a homicide sergeant, I'm sorry, and also a uh, internal affairs sergeant with the Baltimore City Police Department, Mr. Keith Jones, and Ms. Melissa Dronesfield, who returns to us after a brief hiatus after spending three years with us prior and 10 years with the Metropolitan uh, uh, the Transit Police. 
Together, we bring about 50 years worth of law enforcement experience to the Charles County Public School System. And as you can imagine, we view the world in a little bit different place than what most educators do. So we bring a little bit more of a balanced approach to things as it relates to safety and security, internal investigations, and emergency management. I'm also in charge of our badging and fingerprinting program, which covers our volunteers, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit, as well as our new background programs that we're doing for our new hires um, and for our substitutes, which Ms. Majors will talk about. I also act as our liaison for our, our school resource officer program, as well as our other community partners. The next thing I'll bring to your attention is the, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. I apologize. Uh, oh, the next thing, sorry. I apologize. The next thing I'll bring to your attention is the fact that one of the first things that Dr. Hill challenged me to do was to create an options-based active shooter response program. I have responded, I was a, happened um, to have the unfortunate opportunity to be at the Great Mills tragedy, so I learned a tremendous amount. Over the last uh, 20 years of my career, I spent a great deal of time studying and teaching police officers how to respond to these events, interviewing officers, and I've had the, um, the unfortunate opportunity to travel to several of these places that have experienced these tragedies. So this year we revamped our program with an options-based active shooter with an options-based active shooter response for our staff and our faculty, as well as including the stop the bleed training. I'm happy to report to you that as of yesterday, between 95 and 95, 95 and 99 percent of our staff has been trained prior to school starting in both an options-based active shooter response as well as the stop the bleed. We're one of the only school systems in the country that will accomplish that. The next thing on our list is the implementation of our volunteer training and background checks. This has been a, 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 a gap that we recognized almost immediately upon my arrival. We, discussed, we worked together in concert with everybody sitting at this table along with many other people with inside of our school system and created a comprehensive training and background check process for anyone who's going to volunteer with inside of our school system. We started, as, uh, we started this on August 15th. Uh, and uh, we've, there's, a, there's definitely a tremendous amount of moving parts that goes with this. So far, as of this morning when I checked, we have over 1,600 people that have completed the registration process to volunteer, and that's with a few days before school starts. So we fully expect that those numbers are going to grow. The next thing that, uh, that we're, we'll talk about is the research of the new student IDs. We're exploring options and exploring a, a, a solutions to create an ID card program across the, our entire system. So every student will be issued an ID card that has a barcode that's attached to it that will allow us to utilize that in many different facets. The challenge, as you can imagine, is trying to figure out how best to incorporate that into the students' daily lives. So we're looking at things such as the use of them during lunch and how they buy their lunches, how our teachers take attendance, using it as a library card. Many of you are familiar with the way the military uses computers and we do have the technology to possibly do something along that lines and access to our mods and bring it going, coming back and forth into our buildings. The next thing that we'll that, that briefly discuss is uh, the, the expanded internal capabilities for communication. As you can imagine, we have over 4,000 employees spread across the 432 square miles of Charles County in 47 different facilities. So making sure that we're communicating and that we have the ability to communicate in such a huge system is always a challenge, and we can always do better. However, with the, with, with the leadership of Mr. Glenn Belmore, who's seated in the front row, who's worked at our system for over 29 years, we've been able to purchase and to implement a program that allows us to take over computers inside of our whole system and flash messages across those computers from campus to campus so that we can um, make sure that we're better communicating. In addition, we've worked with the Charles County uh, Department of Emergency Services and our 911 center to implement a program where our, our administrators, as well as several executives at the school level, will also receive text messages anytime that there's a call that's either initiated or received at any of our facilities within the county. That way we can do some additional investigation. We've made some additional radio enhancements within the sign of the school. One of the biggest things that we're proud of is that this year we're having our bus, we've, we've en enabled the system to our, where our bus drivers can communicate directly to the public safety communications building at the 911 center. So our bus drivers will be able to uh, communicate when, when they either see or have, have, have been experiencing events that they need to get a hold of the police directly with. 
The last thing is, is we're working on imp the Im implementation of putting um, public safety radios in several of our facilities or inside of our buildings to ensure that our communications uh, can be as fast and as accurate as we possibly can at any given time. The next thing on there is the, uh, the enhancement of the information sharing between stakeholders. Our all ha we, we've created an all-hazard approach uh, where we bring as many different of our community caretaking partners in together as we possibly can. We just had our meeting on Monday. We had over 30 people from across both state, federal, and local, uh, from across the spectrum from state, local, and, rep and federal representatives. We even had people from the ATF and the FBI come because they're interested in what we're doing, and we're establishing a model that school other school systems want to participate in. That's all. We've also created uh, the ability to be able to share information between many of the different intelligence agencies that exist between the Maryland Coordination and Analysis Center or the Washington, D.C. WARTAC to where we're able to ensure that we know what's going on in the surrounding areas at all times, especially as we're sending our children all over the national capital region for field trips for educational opportunities. The last thing is, is that we've established a, a Twitter feed that I would join you if you tweet. I invite you to, and, and to include the CCPS Twitter feed. We've also created the Office of Safety and Security Twitter feed, which is CCPS Safe, if you'd like to join us. And the hope is, is we can grow that, so if we do have any critical events that occur, that our children can be able to directly communicate with us over social media. One of the things that we learned at Great Mills was our media partners will attempt to communicate directly with our children instead of letting us communicate so that we can get the correct information as fast as we can to pass that along to our first responders. The last thing is something that uh, I will tell you that I'm extremely proud of uh, is that we are currently working with the College of Southern Maryland to create a system-wide family unification location at the campus, at our La Plata campus, at the PE building. We believe that what we, could, we can learn from other places that have had tragic events, and if we have to do a mass evacuation of one of our schools, we believe that the PE building is the best fit in our community to be able to rendezvous our parents as quickly as we possibly can with their children who have been affected by that tragedy. So as you can see, in a very short period of time, this team has accomplished a tremendous amount. You're going to hear a lot more as we go on. Safety and security has been a, a top priority at the Charles County Public School System, and it will continue to be. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you, and I'm looking forward to answering many of your questions. Before Mr. Heim gets started, I want to once again recognize Glenn Belmore. He was recently named as the Safety Director of the State of the Year by the Maryland Center for School Safety. So Glenn, thank you for what you do and what you've done for years to keep our kids safe. Mr. Heim. Good evening. I'm Mike Heim. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Supporting Services. <clears throat> I have the pleasure of working alongside many great staff members in the following offices. Transportation, and I have Brad Snow, who's our Director of Transportation, here this evening. <clears throat> also have Steve Andritz, who's our Director of Planning and Construction, here this evening. And the other two offices, Steve uh, Vance, who's our Supervisor of Maintenance, and our Supervisor of Operations, April Murphy. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration that's occurred uh, in the last six months between the offices of Planning Construction and Maintenance to put together these projects, uh, design uh, to work with contractors uh, to make sure that you know, the things that we're doing, that we're compliant with ADA issues, also compliant with the fire marshal, and also uh, you know, with egress issues from the building, and also not impacting uh, heating and, and uh, cooling in, in certain areas. One of the first things is we addressed and did assessments of our schools uh, is we have concerns with the front entrances to a number of our buildings. And, and on the slide, you see, should see a picture of John Hansen Middle School. And what I mean by that is all of our main buildings are locked. When you come to the front entrance of a building, there's an A phone there. You push that button. Uh, there's a camera so the staff who's in the front office can see who's at the entrance. They ask you who you are, your reason for being in the building, and then they'll hit an electronic release which opens that door. <clears throat> the issue is that our newer facilities, we have what we call a guided vestibule, which means that once you are buzzed into the building, you're funneled directly into the main office. The concern with our older buildings is that <clears throat> you're buzzed into, uh, into the building and you have free access in over 21 of our buildings, which means that once you're buzzed in, you don't have to go directly into the main office. In some cases with our elementary schools, we have our cafeterias and gyms that are right there near the front entrance. So 
parents, visitors, whoever it may be, would have free access into those areas without actually going into the main office. So to correct that, we've been working with architects and those offices of uh, maintenance and planning construction to develop a plan to address those concerns in 21 schools. This summer, because they were what we call easier fixes, uh, we were able to address uh, the front entrances at Lackey, La Plata, Stone, Westlake, Hanson, Stoddard, and Wade. And in the fall, we'll finish projects at Jennifer, Mattawan, Middleton, and Steedham Educational Center. Uh, and again, working with those, we had to work with architects to make sure, again, that we're not in uh, violation of ADA issues, egress from the building, and also make sure that we're in compliant with the fire marshal. So we're trying to keep people from going to certain areas of the building, but also we have to make sure that for fire drills or the event of a real evacuation, that those vestibules that we put up are not a barrier to people being able to exit the, the building. Uh, and we're working with two other architects to on designs of those other schools. Uh, and we are fortunate to have received funding from our county government, the county commissioners, uh, last spring. So the collaboration between the school system and those commissioners, they, uh, we have a two-year funding project from them to work on those vestibules and some other areas uh, that we're going to talk about. So again, we're very appreciative of the county government and the commissioners uh, and the support they've shown uh, in making these projects happen. Other things that we want to do, as you can see from the slide, once we've created these vestibules and also other areas, uh, front entrances, glass areas around main offices, we want to add film to uh, window areas. And it's not a bullet-resistant film, but it is a shatter-resistant film. So then what that means is, in the event that someone has a baseball bat or someone would shoot through, well, if you would shoot through, it's going to make holes, but it's not, the glass is not going to shatter. So the entire window, the door, the glass is not going to fall out. And <clears throat> those products usually sustain about 30 to 45 seconds of someone kicking and batting at them after a puncture hole has been made into that. So what that does is that gives staff time to notify others in the building and time for them to evacuate from that area and put our plans in place uh, that we have created. Going on to the next slide, <clears throat> another concern is once someone is in our building, <clears throat> we have 11 open space schools in our school system. That doesn't mean that all 11 of them are total open space schools. Out of that 11, a number of them are partially uh, enclosed spaces, which means they have four classroom walls and a door. But another concern we have uh, is we went to close in all classroom areas to make sure that they have walls and a door that is, is lockable. Uh, this summer we began phase one of phase two at Middleton Elementary School to enclose and create hallways and enclose those, those classrooms. Not an easy fix. Uh, again, you have to work with uh, architects to make sure that we are not creating issues with uh, electricity, lighting. Also, we're not impacting heating and cooling in those areas. And again, working with egress and ADA and fire marshal uh, compliance. And, uh, and also is expensive. So the project, the two-phase project, two-year phase project we have at Middleton is going to cost us somewhere between $3.5 and $4 million uh, to do that. And we've been able to do that through some of our own year-end funding uh, and some additional funding through some former programs, QZAB money, which was a state and federal money, uh, which came from uh, from some taxes, but again, that uh, is no longer going to be in place. So we're working uh, to make sure we continue phase two of that to enclose those areas. We have design on three other schools that are open space schools, Brown Elementary School. Uh, we're going to be submitting a plan to the state for funding from the state uh, to enclose that area. And we have two major renovations planned at two other open space schools, Stoddard Middle School and Eva Turner Elementary School. And again, we're submitting those plans to the state for funding. And the way our state funding works out with major projects like that, 61% of the funding comes from the state and then 39% comes from local funding, the, the county government. Uh, so we're very optimistic and very hopeful that we will get uh, the okay from the state to proceed with, with those. And then we'll continue to work on the other eight schools that either are fully or partially open space to develop plans and um, have designs in place to make those uh, projects happen as well. Uh, Mr. Stoddard talked about card readers. We've been adding additional card readers to the exterior of our buildings. And what that means is for staff, their badge, uh, they can swipe in at those card readers. So <clears throat> what that means is a, a, phys ed, a class that's going outside for phys ed, that phys ed teacher can use their card to swipe a card reader, which is located at the outside of the door, so they can get back into the building uh, when they return into the building. And that way, they're not propping doors open. What we don't want is we don't want teachers, phys ed teachers, or just a science teacher who may be going outside for a project, or elementary teachers when they take their classes out for recess. We don't want doors being propped open because we know what those potential issues can lead to. So we've been adding exterior card readers uh, 
to as many locations around the exterior of the building as we can. In the event that something is happening outside, our staff can get quickly back into, into the building. <clears throat> Some other things that we are doing, we've been adding additional cameras. We know that cameras are not going to prevent all types of activities, uh, but they do prevent some type of activities, uh, but more so they lead to help us in investigation after an event has occurred. So we've been adding more cameras. Uh, at the start of the summer, we had 1,187 cameras uh, throughout our combined seven high schools, eight middle schools, and 21 elementary schools. Uh, again, working with the county commissioners, money that was, uh, that was you know, put, put towards us for funding, We're working on some fencing projects uh, around perimeter of buildings and also around some playground areas. <clears throat> now, there are some concerns with that. We have to, again, work with, consider with the fire marshal and making sure that we have egress. So when we put up those structures around a playground, we're not totally fencing that in completely, but again, because we need to have egress from those areas. But it is a barrier to have prevent someone from walking up from the uh, exterior up to those areas where kids may be outside for, for recess. <clears throat> and, one, <clears throat> excuse me, and one of the last projects we are working on, and again, this is a collaboration with emergency responders, fire police, and EMS, is uh, using a numbering system, uh, which is a universal uh, accepted numbering system, on all of our exterior doors of all of our buildings. So what that means is starting at the main entrance, a numbering one, and then working around to the left of the building, wrapping around. <clears throat> Uh, numbering all those number of the, uh, doors from the exterior, but also the interior. So in the event that we do have an emergency at a building, we can quicken that response to emergency responders to go to that exact location uh, where emergency responders are, are needed. Uh, so those are a number of the major projects we're working on and a number of other minor things that we are uh, also working on. At this um, time, I'll turn it over to Nikki Majors. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Nikki Majors, as Mr. Himes said, and I'm one of the newer members of the executive leadership team with Charles County Public Schools. I joined in the fall of last year after working in downtown Washington between two major law firms uh, for the last 20 years, so I'm, I'm happy to be a part of the school system now. Uh, one of the major improvements that we've made within the human resources function that we're all very proud of is layering on a social security number-based background check. For more than 30 years, um, Charles County Public Schools has performed background investigations on new hires um, at a state and federal level via our uh, criminal justice information system, but there were some gaps that um, existed with that system. So by layering on a Social Security number-based background check, we can take a deeper dive into a new hire's um, background, look at their criminal history. It searches every address that person has ever lived at, whether it be within the United States or internationally, and it looks at records um, as deep as the county level, even county courthouse um, records. So that really gives us a broader picture, if you will, of whether or not that individual is suitable for hire. Um, Anyone who's a police officer will tell you that fingerprints don't always tell you a story, the story about an individual, because there are individuals who are charged criminally that never do a day in jail. They're never fingerprinted. So we feel that layering on this additional safeguard, if you will, is beneficial in terms of our school safety and security. And we, as I understand it, are one of the few school districts who are taking that measure around the country. So again, this is something that we're very proud of from an HR standpoint. And we worked collaboratively with the Office of Safety and Security um, to put this in place. And so every new hire is uh, currently undergoing this uh, background check. Um, there are still some ongoing discussions, to be frank and transparent, around a group of employees who have worked for the system for many, many, many years and uh, probably are close to retiring. And so we're trying to decide for those individuals who may not have ever been fingerprinted, and it's a very small group, um, how we're going to handle that. And that's a conversation with human resources, safety and security, as well as legal counsel. So I just want to be transparent that there is a small group who's never been fingerprinted and we're currently discussing how to handle that. Um, the other thing that we've done from an HR standpoint 
is really made some significant improvements to our orientation and onboarding, um, specifically the program content and how it's structured to make sure that new hires coming in the door are getting information about um, safety, security, misconduct, things that can get you in trouble, like putting your hands on a child when they come through the door. Um, we've put Jason Stoddard and his team into our orientation and onboarding program and he does a really good job of covering policies and procedures around that area. So hopefully that is another preventive measure that will keep people out of trouble and Jason always says save them, <laughs> save them from themselves. Um, the other thing that we've um, done is we kicked off these onboarding sessions back in June um, and to date we've probably had close to 250 new teachers experience that onboarding process. And what we've also done, and I know uh, there's a member of my team here, Ms. Louise Evans, who coordinates our substitutes. We worked with the Office of Instruction, the Office of Safety and Security, and together with Human Resources to enhance our substitute training. We've actually required all of our substitutes to be retrained because we have a large contingent of community members who come into our schools each day to substitute for teachers on a daily basis or long-term basis who may be out on leaves of absence. And it's always good for people to be provided with a refresher, specifically around safeguards related to safety and security, things that they're mandated to report, things that they should not be uh, doing, such as texting students, for example. So we wanna make sure that people are um, well-educated about the do's and don'ts and the risks associated with getting into, um, getting into mishaps. Um, we've also worked with our Office of Safety and Security, um, our Office of Risk Management, our Office of Student Services, uh, who provides mental health um, resources to revamp our child abuse uh, training and our safe schools training generally to make sure that, again, people are getting the latest and greatest information that they need to help us to continue to protect our kids every day. So those are just a few of the enhancements that we made um, within our Office of, of Safety and Security. And I think I um, want to also mention, it. Are there, is there anyone else in the office from, in the audience from Office of HR? I think I see Ms. Colomo, who provides administrative support. Any other HR team members? Well, I just wanted to thank our Office of Human Resources staff because they worked very, very hard over the summer to staff nearly 300 um, teaching positions so that when the uh, doors open on Tuesday that our students have qualified teachers in the classroom. So just wanted to extend a public thank you to our Human Resources staff. And now I will pass it over to Ms. Kiesling from our Student Services <coughs> Department. You can clap for Ms. That's good. <laughs> good evening. I am Kathy Kiesling. I'm the newest member of the team. I am the Director of Student Services for Charles County Public Schools. And I come with a little bit different perspective. I have been in the county for 25 years as an educator. 17 of those years have been a principal in a school or an administrator in the school. So um, one of the things that I have the honor of doing is supervising those people who are actually resources in the buildings working directly with the students. And so part of my job is to work with the counselors and the school psychologists in the county. And I'd like to speak tonight a little bit about the expansion of services that have occurred in the past couple years with those resources. Um, partnering with the Center for Children in four of our secondary schools this year is something that uh, we have not had in the past. And this partnership is not only going to bring resources just for the students in the building, but for the families as well. Um, Full-time psychologists in all of our secondary schools, which we did not have before, uh, we now have them in the high schools and middle schools, and actually four elementary schools have full-time school psychologists. So that is another enhancement. All schools have the services of the school psychologist, but now we have full-time people in those schools. Um, our focus is uh, for the, the state is always been the mental health piece mm -hmm. has been um, wraparound services and extra resources. So we're looking at the state funding that they're giving us in terms of grants 
and focusing on putting more mental health resource personnel into our buildings. And that's coming in the future. We have new programs in um, some of our elementary schools. Three of our elementary schools now have the Aspire program. It's a therapeutic behavioral based program. It services students in kindergarten through grade two, and it helps teach coping skills to correct inappropriate behaviors. So that's something that is going on right now in three of our elementary schools, and we're hoping to expand that as well. We also have um, the Handle with Care program that's going to be starting. I think that's on the next slide. The Governor's Office of Crime Prevention has uh, implemented this in statewide, and we have adopted it here in Charles County. The uh, program addresses children who are exposed to trauma events in their residence, and this would be after hours. Um, and what we do is we partner with the Charles County Department of Emergency Services to receive information if there should be a traumatic event in a home. They would contact the school board and let us know that there were students in our system that may have had some traumatic event happen at home. And what they would tell us is just basically to handle these children with care. The school board would then in turn contact the schools before they open in the morning to let the principal and anybody know that would need to know that these students coming in may need some extra support. And all they would know is just to handle them with care so that they can possibly put resources in place, school counselors, school psychologists to be on the watch. These children should come in with um, certain needs that day. Um, our restorative practices is something that's growing in all of our schools. It provides schools with alternatives to conventional consequences for students, but it also helps students build relationships and take, um, and take their own um, initiative in self-discipline. Mm -hmm. So we create these relationships by putting the students, staff members, and anybody who may be involved in an incident at school together to, in, a, in a restorative circle and to discuss and collaborate and figure out what went wrong and how it could be done differently the next time and actually allow the students to come up sometimes with their own consequence. So um, it's an ongoing training that's been happening since last year in the schools. Um, it is practiced in multiple schools here now, and we hope for it to continue and grow as, as time goes on. And those are just some of the enhancements that we're working with with the students in mental health in our schools. I'm going to pass it on to Ms. Charmaine Thompson. Good evening. Uh, my name is Charmaine Thompson. I'm the uh, Chief of Instruction Technology. I came to Charles County uh, roughly a year ago. I bring over 17 years of experience in the field of educational technology. I'm very fortunate. I, I, I must say I came to a staff that was already doing great things. I'm here with my executive director of IT strategy, Ms. Laura Bennett, over here on your right. Um, I wanted to sort of give you some brief updates as to what we've been busy with over the summer. I do thank the Security and Safety Council. I was on the subcommittee of cybersecurity as given us some suggestions and input of how we can better enhance our system. We also got some great suggestions from an internal cybersecurity audit that we had conducted from an outside agency. In the area of technology, we did upgrade our new uh, wireless uh, network, uh, BYOD. Pretty much now, all of our staff and students have to authenticate with their uh, username and passwords. Uh, of course, they're probably not going to like it, but uh, this will better enhance our network so that we can set better user permissions as well as track our users and devices, whether they're a CCBOE issue device or a device that they bring on their own. Um, we also uh, went through an RFP process where we selected and implemented a new content filtering system, um, pretty much because there's kids in the audience with a more robust content filtering system. It helps kind of keep out the bad stuff and also to help protect us from threats known and unknown. Uh, also, with this content filtering system, it can allow us to do better threat analysis and prevention, as well as set better user uh, policy controls. And lastly, a big component that we discussed in our cybersecurity subunit was education and training, because I think that is a, an amazing a pre preventative measure that you can implement in a school district. In addition to a lot of the internet safety that we teach throughout our curriculum, uh, I'm also thinking to expand that out to the community. 
We're starting with doing some parent information ses uh, sessions. I've partnered with the U.S. Attorney's Office and offering some internet safety uh, for parents. The first one is going to be September 25th, so please mark your calendars and look for that uh, information on the location. But the name of that session is uh, Innocence Stolen Protecting Our Children. I have uh, three children of my own, 14, 11, and three years old. And I think it's very important to educate our parents also how to navigate social media, to watch for things like cyberbullying, um, to be nosy, to be involved in what your kids are doing online. Because I think that can help as we work together and partner together in a relationship to notify the school to say, hey, I noticed something on Twitter or I saw something on my son's Snapchat. Uh, the same issue happened in my son's school. I was able to circumvent an issue that was going to occur the next day with bullying and a fight because I was being nosy on his Snapchat and I saw some messages that came across. So I'm really hoping to help better educate our parents here in the district and as well as our staff. I'll be doing some email phishing sessions with our principal secretaries. They handle a lot, a lot of our financial transactions. As you know, hackers try to uh, do things with uh, ransomware and phishing. So I'm going to educate them better on what to look for uh, through emails because they look very legitimate. You might get an email to say, oh, I need your credit card number. I need you to call the IRS and verify your social security number. And to just kind of be aware of things like that. In addition to upgrading some uh, information that we want to put out for our staff over just basic cybersecurity tips. So uh, again, these are just some of the updates we've made in technology. I'm certainly open to suggestions on other things we should look for or offer. So again, thank you for being here. And next, I'm going to pass it over to Katie O'Malley uh, Simpson, our Director of Communication. Good evening. I'm Katie O'Malley Simpson. I'm the Director of Communication. And we've done a number of things over the summer to include more opportunities for us to communicate with you, but also for parents and students to communicate with us. We hope to have many more town halls and public forums uh, where we can come together and talk about different issues. Uh, tonight is one of those. Uh, two of the things that uh, our staff created this summer in conjunction with other departments, the first is a page that's called See Something, Say Something. And this is an anonymous reporting tool uh, where people, students, parents, staff can report uh, staff misconduct, bullying, anything that they would like to they can do it anonymously. There are places where they can put their name and number if they want to contact us or let us contact them for more information. But it's an easy way that you can reach us to tell us that you think that something's not correct. Uh, there is a button on the front of the www.ccboe.com www website uh, right on the front page that gives you easy access to that. The second is a page uh, that Mr. Stoddard talked about earlier with our volunteers. Uh, you can go to the front of our website, you can connect to sign up as a volunteer very easily. It'll take you less than a half an hour to go through the training and to apply. Um, we also, uh, along with technology, are planning some parent nights along with some of our partners in the community to provide information about things like how to identify if a child is being sexually abused or abused. Um, and I would like to thank my staff uh, who are here. They're the people behind the cameras that greeted you and are taking the questions off of Twitter tonight. We certainly welcome your suggestions for any improved com communications that we can give you. Thank you. Dr. Hill? Thank you, Katie. So I'm surrounded by an amazing team, and I hope that you've heard the credibility and expertise that is working together to protect your children. Uh, the reason that Katie and Charmaine are down uh, there is because they're monitoring social media and, and, and bringing questions, which they just did, to us from the folks who are joining us virtually. But in addition to the team members that I have up here on the stage, I have two important team members in the audience who I'd like to take a second to recognize, and then we're going to move on to your questions. Um, none of this would happen if we didn't have someone managing a $370 million budget so that we could free up funds to do the things that we've been doing in addition to the $5.8 million the county commissioners provided us in capital monies, and we do appreciate that, Commissioner Stewart. But uh, our Assistant Superintendent for Fiscal Services, Randy Sotomayor, is here. Our Deputy Superintendent, Amy Holstein, out by the front greeting folks. Thank you for everyone else that we need. 
So one of Amy's um, big pushes this year that all of us have jumped on board immediately is what you see behind us, hashtag choose kind. We are pushing this out. I hope that you will hear this as your children come home from school next week. Their teachers are talking about it. Their principals are talking about it. We as a community are going to work to come together, and the school system is willing to lead this in choosing kindness. Every decision, every action that you take in your personal life or your professional life is a choice. And you can choose to do things in a way that is sympathetic, empathetic, caring, and sensitive, or you can choose not to. And we're asking our staff, our principals, and our students that when they're faced with that choice of how to handle a situation, that they choose to handle it in a way that they are kind. Simple kindness is something that we don't promote and talk about enough. And so I hope that you'll help us with that message at home. We hope to spread this beyond just the school system to county government, to the business community, and all of our Charles County residents will join us in choosing to be kind to one another. With that, it's time for questions. So what I'd like to do to create a little bit of order, if you checked in and wanted to ask a question and you're, have, you have numbers one through six, if the odd numbers will go to this mic and the even numbers will go to this mic, while you're assembling at the mics, we could take a look at a question from our virtual audience from Twitter. Do our SROs have training on how to effectively communicate, interact, and respond to those in our special needs population? That's the first question that we have from, the, from our Twitter audience. Um, Mr. Stoddart, you want to take a stab at that? So uh, the state of Maryland under, uh, just to give you a little background, I was a school resource officer at Lackey High School from 2003 to 2006 before I, uh, before I moved on to other things with the sheriff's office. Uh, the state of Maryland in the House Bill 1265, the Safe to Learn Act, required standardized training across the state for all school resource officers beginning this year. So this, the Maryland Center for School Safety has been working hard to ensure that they have meet the deadlines, which I believe was September of this year. Uh, and I'm proud to report that they have met those deadlines and had an approved curriculum to the Maryland Police Training Commission. So they will receive this type of training as it results in special need population, as well as uh, a, a vast amount of other training. Um, now, prior to that, I'm also proud to tell you that this Charles County Sheriff's Office has been a member of the National Association of School Resource Officers, NASRO, for many years. And they have uh, a majority of all the school resource officers that have worked throughout the entire system since the program was implemented have received NASRO training, which also includes communication strategies, de-escalation, and things such as that for many years. So the short answer is yes, they do receive that training. My next question is for the security guy right here. <laughs> is there a reason why you choose um, to use the barcode system versus the CAC system? So as it sits today, um, and there's, there, we're not settled on anything at this point. Okay. So it is, we are speeding as fast as we possibly can, but it is a heavy lift. Um, 27,000 students, and we're looking for as much input as we possibly can. I heard yesterday that Prince George's County has had um, some sort of a badging system for many years for their students. So we are constantly looking to, um, to, to the best products that are out there, but at the same time, we need to be fiscally responsible. We, we as Mr. Sotomayor standing behind you, I love to spend his money. Um, <laughs> uh, but we also need to make sure that we're, that we're moving into the 21st century as fast as we possibly can with those, and those technologies are continuing to change. And that, that was my concern because with a CAT system, you can, it, it evolves with technology. Mm -hmm. And if you have an independent student that's, 
that poses a threat, then your physical security manager can just restrict the access for that one student, and it doesn't affect everybody else. And I, I believe we currently have a hybrid system that's very similar to that as okay. it relates to some of our entryways and things like that that we currently okay. have. Um, but I would love to talk to you offline and learn more about that, that technology um, that. and see okay. how we can move forward with something like that. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Tanya Brevard. I have one question. And I don't recall hearing any information pertaining to the safety for the kids who are in the trailer. I have a great concern for the elementary kids and kids who are in the trailer because if, if, I, call, if I recall correctly, the new schools have it so you go straight into the building. But you have other schools that's in uh, Charles County that the kids are in the trailer. And that was a concern for one of my kids when they was in the elementary school. How are you planning on improving the safety for the kids in the trailers? So we classify trailers, <clears throat> educational cottages, modular <clears throat> buildings uh, in two different ways. We have single units, which is just a single classroom. You can, mm -hmm. So you can think of kind of like the old room, you know, one school uh, room, uh, schoolhouse. Then we have what we call our complexes where you might have a quad uh, or in some schools like Davis and Diggs, you have a complex of eight, which have a common hallway. Same thing with the quads. We have a common hallway which connects all those classrooms. And you can go to a larger uh, complex like North Point that has actually 25 classrooms outside connected by two, two common hallways. <clears throat> so our procedures for a single one-room classroom is that those exterior doors, and most of them have two exterior doors, that they are locked uh, just like the main building would be. So if a student needs to go to the restroom or is called into the office for, uh, you know, or needs to go to the nurse's office, needs to go to the counseling office, what they do is they get a generic card, just like a teacher ID, and they take that card and they go to the closest access point into the building and they swipe that and that gains them access into the building. If we, a quad area or the eight unit complex like we have with the common hallway, those exterior doors leading into the hallways, which then in the hallway you can get into the classrooms, those are locked and we have card readers on them just like we do the main building. So we can keep those hallways locked so you know someone from the outside cannot get in there. So again, the same thing with the student who's going to the restroom or going to another part of the main building. The teacher gives them that card, they go into the closest access point in the building, do what they need to do, come back out and swipe back into the hallway. What happens if one of those cards is kept inadvertently or purposely or is lost, as Mr. Stoddard was talking about, those cards can be deactivated remotely. So there's a code with that card and that particular card can be deactivated. Also, those generic cards, they're only set for normal hours of operation. So let's just say a card is taken inadvertently or purposely. When that card is deactivated, or when it's deactivated, but even before it's deactivated, it's only during the normal hours of operation. So if there is a lapse in that card being reported to our security office, that student tries to come back at midnight, uh, it's only set for normal hours of operation, so it would not open up any of those areas. Uh, you know, other things with, with the, uh, you know, the trailers or modulars in terms of, of security. Uh, in the event that we have severe weather events, if we have a tornado warning and those types of things, we bring the students from those trailers into the main building when we have severe weather uh, related issues. Ma'am, if I could, if I could uh, bring into this discussion a related question from Twitter. How are you educating students? A big security issue, even for adults, is tailgating through secure doors. In other words, our kids have been raised by our community to be polite. So if they see someone coming up the sidewalk who's carrying something, they may say, oh, I'll get the door for you. So we've been doing, through our principals, we've been tra working on training our students that the polite thing to say is, I'm sorry, I can't open the door for you, and we're going to keep those doors closed. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is a common issue that we would ask all of our community to don't be offended if when you're walking in with another parent, the door is shut, and then you have to do your ID to the uh, aid phone, is that what you call yes. it, the access point out front. Uh, it happened to me down at one of our elementary schools. Two teachers walked in, I was right behind them, they said, I'm sorry, you can't come in. We're gonna shut the door, and I was proud of them for doing that. So that's, that's an education piece that all of us will have to work together on. Well, we also have, just like we have the interior of buildings, we have exterior cameras also. So we try to put cameras in those areas where students would be trafficking and staff would be trafficking back and forth from the mods to the, to the main building. Now in the future, do you have any plans to get rid of them? Because 
threat for them from walking from point A to point E. So are you planning on doing anything or is there anything in the funds to get rid of them? Because it would be best to have them all in one big building where they're really safe. In an, in an ideal world, we would have no you know, trailers, modular buildings, uh, but it, you know, this is an issue throughout the state of Maryland with enrollment increases. Uh, so one of the issues we've had, uh, why we have them in the first place, is we've not been able to keep up with the enrollment growth that has, has occurred. Uh, so some of our trailers are locally owned, but also so some are owned by the, the state. So the state actually has a program because enrollment increases are an issue in Charles County, but throughout most areas of, of the state. Uh, so you know the issue is when you build a building, you want to try to fill that building to a capacity or near to capacity. But when you build a new building in a growth area, that growth continues. And the issue is it's a long process to get an addition placed on a building. It's even a longer process to get a new building built uh, and going through the, the appropriate steps you have to take uh, to secure that st state and local funding. So in an ideal world, yes, we would try to get rid of all of our modular buildings, but the reality is, you know, and again, this is the last two school years, we're seeing a tremendous amount of growth in Charles County. Uh, we've seen over 400 students in, in the past two school years. So we're trying to be very proactive and making sure that we have plans in place to have new schools built. Uh, but again, you know, it, it is a lengthy process. And so that, so that our community <clears throat> knows, we are, are one of the fastest growing school districts in the state, enrollment wise. There are many of my colleagues, superintendents throughout the state who are agonizing over having to close schools. And Those so we animals. take that as a compliment in that the product that we're offering, the education that we're offering our children is valued so much that folks are coming to us for the services that we provide. But you bring up a very good, a very good point about the challenge of, tra of trailers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There were two add-ons for the trailer. Here's one more trailer question, if you don't mind, since we're on that subject from Twitter. Will the Shatter film be on trailers? So that will be something that we have to look at. Not all of our trailers may have glass, which is what this product works best on, is glass and plexiglass, um, the, or the glass that's similar to what you see inside of your vehicles. Um, and if there's a, a, a plexiglass glass that's on any of those trailers, the film won't work as it's intended. So it will be something that we have to examine, um, and it will be something that we, we, that we do look at. There isn't a problem with looking at that. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Thank you for your time. My name is Janetha Jones, and I have a question that's specific to Milton Summers. When you were speaking of the guided entrance earlier mm -hmm. in the presentation, do you have an idea or a tentative time frame on when Milton Summers will undergo the guided entrance renovations? Sure, so Summers is one of our more difficult uh, projects because you come in and you have you know, the gym off to, to your right, you have the cafeteria nearby, uh, you have access you know, to go to the left to other classroom areas, and once you know, going down those hallways, you have access to, to the second floor. So we'll be working with an architect to develop a design. Uh, some important decisions need to be made there, uh, whether we're gonna be puncturing through the exterior directly into the main office, but again, it's having to work with an architect because of breaking through load bearing walls and such. So again, it, it's a, a little bit of a process to have an architectural design in place. Uh, also, when we're making some major improvements like that, if we're going to potentially, because Summers is one of those uh, schools we could potentially be moving in the office area uh, and switching out with some uh, potential classroom areas. And we do things like that. We need to consult with the state when they get to a certain uh, level of, of pricing. But uh, so Summers is on, on our project list. Uh, the best case scenario with Summers, we would have design and we potentially begin work on that during the summertime. Uh, more likely because that is a, one of the more difficult projects. Uh, we would like to have all these com projects completed in a three year span. So Summers along with Henson and a couple other schools uh, could be uh, in that uh, more longer three year plan. But we want to make sure that when we do that, that we're, you know, we're not trying to cut any corners, we'll make sure that we're doing something that is, is, will be long, you know, long term and long lasting. Thank you. Sure. Yes, sir. Good evening. Good evening. My name is uh, Keith Brevard and I have a couple of questions. One for physical, physical security and one for cyber. Uh, the physical security, um, the question I have is when you plus up on your front of your school buildings that you're doing, do you have anything in place to keep 
um, a bag after rolling the vehicle through the front door that, that may be deterred because of you plushed up the front building. They just can't walk in. Do you have anything in place for that or going to be in place? So what all, what all, uh, that's a, a wonderful question because the threat continues to change and we recognize that. Um, and we have seen vehicles become a, a, a use, uh, more in use in a lot of different attacks. Um, and there are stanchions that we can place, that we can do things. However, just like anything else, um, we do have to sit down and there's a lot of different ideas that are out there and prioritize where we're going to start and where we're going to go. Um, so, uh, you know, if you've, ever, if you've been downtown, you've seen the, the, the barriers that pop up out of the ground, you've seen all the, the stanchions, and even the local police department recently has put in uh, the, the concrete pillars that are in front of the buildings. Um, you know, one of the constant challenges that we face is, is the best security is the security that you can't see. And we don't want to turn our schools into fortresses. Okay. We want them to look and to be inviting in places where kids can learn. So those are, those are ideas that eventually, yes, I'm very proud to tell you we will look at. However, there's some other things that, that, are, that I think we probably need to prioritize. Um, and, but that is something that we are going to examine in the future. Okay, all right. And for cyber, you mentioned that you, were, you had something in place to, to, that the students had to log in using their own authentication. Now, what about, do you have anything in place for those devices that will not be on Charles County networks in, in the school building area? Yes, that's actually uh, what our BYOD network is. Obviously, we um, have students who bring their own devices to school, laptops, iPads. Uh, with that, they have, to, they have to authenticate with their own username and passwords. So, for instance, if you're a guest on our campus and you bring your own device, we have a guest network, which we have to provide them that account. So it makes it harder for anyone, which is why we upgraded our wireless network prior to that. Any matter of fact, it was funny, when I got hired, they said within like an hour, the password to our network was already out throughout the district. So now when visitors come or students who are no longer in our district, Regardless if they have the password or not, that protects us more because you would have to have an account to log into our network. So we made that enhancement. Make, the students are probably going to not like it a little bit more, but it, it's better enhancement for security. Okay, yeah. I, I understand that part. What, what I'm trying to say is, for for the cyberbullying, yes. everybody, all the kids have smartphones now, and they all have data plans. Do you have anything in place to to like restrict usage of Technology, I mean, technology inside the school buildings. Yeah. Our content field training, and I'll let my uh, director, if she wants to speak more on that, we do filter out a lot of uh, sites such as YouTube. So even when they're on our network, a lot of those sites are blocked and they can't get to them. And I'm talking about the, the devices that won't be on your network. Yeah. Like if I walk in the front door and I have my cell phone, I'm not on Charles County network. No, sir. However, I can still get on Twitter, I can still get on Facebook, and the cyberbullying doesn't stop there. And, and I was wondering, do you have anything like a dampening device or something to, to block signals? We discussed the school that. I actually had that question before. And unfortunately, we can't, by law, have what they call cell phone blockers when you come into the building. To be honest, there is no 100% foolproof way to prevent students from do, logging into these social networks on their own data plans and accessing these sites. Uh, mentioned earlier, the best preventative way we can do is continue to educate our students on being, you know, digital natives and being responsible online. I get there are bad people. Kids are going to still be rude and still do things online. And again, we're just going to continuously educate them. But again, there is, we just unfortunately, by law, we can't, uh, Laura, correct me if I'm wrong, we can't put the cell phone blockers. And I, that, that's a question I got asked as soon as I walked in the door. In a perfect world, we work in a three-letter agency, maybe we could. I used to work with DOD and there were other security parameters we were allowed to do, but unfortunately we can't. We even looked at potential software programs that could, you know, monitor our social networks, but that's so robust and they're not even foolproof, you know. Right. You know, they sent back a lot of false negatives. So we are, we constantly are looking at ways that we can improve and enhance, but to be honest, and I know it sounds uh, cliche, but to continue to educate our kids on just, you know, responsible use online. Like for my son, when he was being bullied, I said, you do know you can delete the app, right? And he did it and we moved on, but I get it. It's still going to be an issue. We're just going to continue to learn to educate our kids. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Definitely. Hello. My name is Tanya Warren. I have a student at Jennifer Elementary. 
I also mentor in the community through my sorority and other organizations. My question is related to mental and physical student safety. It is my understanding that the representation of the teaching staff isn't replicated in the student population and that this has caused problems in the past. Has there been or is there any diversity training that has been or will be put into place to address the issues with uneven punishment of minority students? Has this been addressed during the new hiring that you mentioned as well? Thank you for the question. And I'm going to ask that we limit our questions to uh, topics of safety and security. Your, your question about cultural competency training, yes, of course, we do comp cultural competency training. And yes, of course, we're trying to uh, recruit and retain a staff that reflects the demographics of our community. Um, I am not aware of any problems, uh, as you suggest, that have occurred because of the makeup of our staff versus the makeup of our students. Um, I believe that our teachers are interested in the achievement of all students, and that's just what we do. Is, you know, so are we, are we trying to become a more diverse organization? Yes, of course we are. Thank you for the question. Okay, I have a Twitter set of questions. Ms. Majors, regarding fingerprinting. Now, have yeah. you moved all my questions no, around here? No, ma'am. I have not touched your questions. Okay. So, they're regarding fingerprinting. So, there are two related questions. One is, are all staff members going through a background check, including cafeteria staff and building service workers? That's an easy, easy one. Yeah. Our three existing staff have been through background checks. As I said, CCPS has been performing fingerprint-based background checks for over 30 years now. Um, there is a current conversation, though, around whether or not um, we can require our current um, pre-existing staff to undergo the new Social Security-based background check. And that, that's, that's the follow-up question, Ms. Okay. Majors. Just so the, the folks in the, in the Twitterverse know that we're addressing their question, will the expanded fingerprint checks be applied to current staff who didn't have it as a new hire? I can tell you that we would like it to be applied to our pre-existing <clears throat> staff, but we're currently um, conversing with legal counsel to figure out if we can require that. Um, and if we can't, why not? If we can, how do we go about doing it? So Jason and I have had ongoing discussions with um, counsel, um, employment counsel, legal counsel around that topic. So stay tuned, um, but our desire mm -hmm. is to require um, our pre-existing staff to undergo social security-based background checks, and we'd actually like to do it randomly every year. And the essential question there is these folks are already employees of Charles County Public right. Schools. To do this next layer of background checks, Social Security based, we have to get a release from <clears throat> all of those employees. And so we're working with our attorney uh, about the process for doing that. But our goal is to have random rolling background checks of all of our employees at a set inter interval. Jason, anything you want to add there? No, ma'am. Okay. You guys have covered it very well. Okay. Any other questions from the audience that's here with us? I have Jeez. Okay. Number 13 through 17, if you'll come up, please. 13 through 17. Yes, ma'am. My name is Angelique Berry, and I am the proud parent of a North Point Eagle, and I had a couple of questions. A number of the things that you talked about today have a direct impact and bearing on our students. Is there a plan in place to communicate some of these things and some of the new changes to the students in other formats other than giving them a document, having them read it, and then sign it? So one of the, the, the when I first came along and we had a lot of discussions, another one of the challenges that Dr. Hill gave me was to figure out a way to update our active shooter training and to figure out a way to update as many policies and procedures as we could, and then to figure out a way to communicate them in an age-appropriate fashion to our students. Um, one of our chief counselor, Ms. Alicia Jones, has taken that on with Dr. Gill, who, Linda Gill, who's standing in the back. And I'm proud to report to you that every one of our students will be given an age-appropriate lesson this year with all the different changes that we've made. When they meet with their counselors, I believe, and I'm new to the system, so I believe that occurs sometime within the first month or so of the school. 
Um, so they will be given a lot of this information in age-appropriate fashion because as we understand, and there's a lot of uh, very educated people that do this job um, that educate our students, um, we can't tell kindergartners the same thing in the same way that we tell 10th graders. So we've designed that and we have a bunch of experts that worked on that. off the beaten path, but with the new voter registration system, I know there's going to be a lot of data captured for people that want to volunteer. How is that data being protected? Being a federal employee, having been the victim of a couple of hackings and people having my identity, is a concern. How are you protecting the privacy of the volunteers? So the, the PII information that is shared with the service that we've contracted with, which is bib.com, and they're a, a, a large corporation that's out of North Carolina. They are required by their own association, the association that they belong to, to meet certain standards, certain cybersecurity issues. To ensure that the, there is, I can't, you can never say zero possibility of a leak, but to re greatly reduce the possibility of a leak, I am the only person that has access to that information. There is no one else in the school system that sees any information as it relates to volunteers. That stays with me. And, and you bring up a good point I'd like to add on a little bit. The See Something, Say Something anonymous reporting tool that we have is the back end of that is routed in a similar way, where if you make a report to this tool, it doesn't just go to everyone. It goes to those people who are most directly responsible for responding to that. So we've tried very hard to co compartmentalize information and get it just to the person who needs to act, rather than having all sorts of people have access to information. Yes, ma'am. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Janet Coker. Um, first, before I ask my question, I just wanted to compliment the school system. I have an autistic child whom I wasn't scared to send to any school just because he was my baby. And uh, the SOAR program at Crate, they've done an amazing job. I, I was worried he'd never learn to read, and they're sure that he's on the track to learning to read in the next couple of years, and I'm just amazed by that. But um, so thank you for that. But my question is, um, to give you a little background, I just came off from January to uh, January to June. Um, I was on one of the grand juries, and it was our unfortunate duty to have indicted at least three teachers for sexual misconduct against students. And I know that's a burden on everyone, but on our last meeting, um, we as a grand jury talked to the state's attorney about what were the best ways to approach some concerns we had brought based on the case for case that we dealt with, some concerns that we had. And they said a public venue like this would be our best option, so I'm glad that we have this chance. But our question, um, our biggest question boiled down to this, do you have a policy in place or are you willing to make a policy that decides uh, what is the threshold for whether or not a student complaint against the teacher will be sent to the police or handled in-house because at least one of the cases probably could have been resolved years ago if staff unfortunately had decided not to instead of doing a reprimand as the police had requested please bring these cases to the sheriff's office and let them decide um, whether or not this was due to investigation and we felt like that was a bit of a loophole that the school fell through there um, are you willing to uh, make a policy about uh, when school administrators should bring something directly to the police and not handle it in-house. Thank you. Good, good questions, and thank you for your service on the grand jury. That had to be a, a very <laughs> difficult experience. Uh, yeah. Um, so what we're doing is, is, is trying to balance two competing needs here. We have the presumption of innocence, and then we have an accusation. So what we're trying to do is every time there is an accusation, the employee is being pulled out of contact with children, and then we turn it over to Mr. Stoddard's office, and his investigators then begin an investigation. So, Mr. Stoddard, do you want to follow up on that and give more detail? So, and I'll also invite Ms. Majors to have this discussion as well, because this is it, it, one thing that we've that I've learned in a system that's this large and the system that. that there are no easy and quick decisions as much as we like to think that there are. So what we've done, um, the, we have moved our internal affairs section, which used to be called staff relation officers before. We've expanded that, we've doubled the size of that, and we've moved it from the HR to, to underneath of me, and I work directly for Dr. Hill. So we do all the fact finding when, it, when there are those allegations. So the fact finding is completely separate than any disciplinary issues that go on at the school level. 
we're governed by a number of laws. Um, as I'm sure everybody in here knows, we are everybody who sits at this table and works with inside of the school system is a mandatory reporter as it relates to child abuse and child sex abuse. Now, those are there is at times when there's been allegations and in the past maybe some uh, investigations that were done at a school level that today would not occur that way. So we have and we do have a policy um, and we are constantly looking to evaluate and looking at those issues that we have to learn from them. One of the best things that I will tell you that this system is, is that I've seen thus far is when there has been missteps and there has been tragedies and issues, they're willing to dissect it from the ground up. Um, and while everybody said that they were the new guy, I assure you I'm the new guy sitting at this table. Um, so they are willing to dissect it from the ground up. And yes, so to answer your question, it has it is being taken care of. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Donald Brackland, and um, I first would like to thank you guys for all the efforts you've made so far to keep our students um, safe in the schools. Um, but I have a question regarding um, disciplinary standards and policies. Um, my daughter actually is in her third year in a high school, Charles County, um, coming from a public school system. And um, when we first brought her into the public school system, we realized it was a world of difference. And one reason for saying this is that we have experienced and come across a number of confrontations between students with one another, and it goes all the way up the chain with students and the administrators and faculty members. Confrontations. Um, my biggest concern is some of the misbehaviors that are performed by the students these days is that they're not intimidated by the disciplinary standards and policies that's in place. So they're not afraid to get in trouble. So they do a lot of questionable things just to see how far they can push the envelope. Um, just in last year alone, my daughter came home one day and said that, Dad, you know, there were three fights today. And one day there were three fights. Another day she says, oh, we had four or five students, at least four students, committing or performing sex acts in public amongst the faculty members. Faculty members may not have been able to see what was happening, but nonetheless it was happening in the public courtyards in the school. And my biggest concern is the standards and policies that we have in place for disciplining the schools is not keeping up with the, with the reality. It's not keeping up with, with what these kids are faced with today and what they are exposed to. We have to make sure that if we are gonna punish the kids, the punishment fits the crime, so to speak, and they know that um, any type of questionable acts that they perform, that they're gonna be reprimanded to a point that they would think twice about doing it again. But that's not happening. So what do you have in place now? Are you guys even looking or considering revamping um, the standard policies that's in place now for disciplining the students? Thank you for that question, sir. Certainly we heard, and I think the, the members of the Board of Education last year heard many concerns from, from students, parents, and teachers regarding discipline policies. And I think what we need to remember is that we want to put in place policies that are going to correct behavior. And when I was in school, the immediate thing that would happen to someone who acted out was that they would get thrown out, right? You get suspended, you go home, and you went home because you had typically a parent or two at home who would then mete out some sort of punishment at home, right? I knew that if I got suspended, my, my life at home was gonna be much worse than any life that I had at school. What we have found really over the last 10 years is that suspension doesn't work. And if our goal is to correct behavior, we have to look at different ways to correct behavior. And we are, we are actively working on that because we expect that we have school classrooms that are places where every student in that room can learn. So we're doing trainings with our, with our teachers, with our principals, 
Um, Ms. Kiesling, maybe you could talk a little bit about restorative practices and how that also is a, an attempt to teach not only appropriate behavior in school, but to begin to teach habits that we all need as adults in our world beyond school. Uh, I would like to speak to that. Um, not only are we uh, looking at the discipline that is taking place in the school and how we can uh, rework that, but we're also looking at the adverse childhood experiences that a lot of our children are experiencing today and what they're bringing to the school. And we want to make sure that our teachers and our staff members are aware that children are coming more and more to school with many different traumatic events happening in their life. And we need to help our staff members understand and learn how to deal with students, not necessarily know what the troubles are, but how to speak with them, how to work with them, how to build those relationships. And that's a very big part of what we've been working on for a couple of years now and why restorative practices has been brought into our system. Because that program helps establish um, and support those caring communities and the community of the school coming together and understanding that children come to school with all different sorts of issues that we need to try to understand, not necessarily what the issue is, but how to work with a child who's experiencing difficulties outside of school. So those, the training that's ongoing with restorative practices is teaching teachers how to speak to children, how to address them, actually using different verbiage when they're in the classroom with them, um, addressing behaviors even down the hallway uh, if they see something taking place. So it's not yelling at them. It's not um, giving them strict consequences all the time, but working through the problem, how and why this happened, what can we do differently, building a stronger community in the school and letting the kids know that we care. We care about them and we want to support them. Um, once they know that you care, sometimes, not always, but many times those behaviors start to change. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build those relationships in the school. That's all fine well, but um, I was questioning more like what are the immediate um, responses coming from the administrators and the administration because some of these acts are pretty brutal. And yes, you may have a, a policy or standard in place of you, know, you go by step by step as to how you're trying to better um, accommodate the child and, and, and teach the child and train the child how to react to certain situations. But while all that is happening, there's much more critical, critical things that's happening right there at the moment. And my concern is how are you handling that? Because people are getting hurt. People are getting hurt because it seems like the administration does not know how to handle these situations. And I just want to bring it to, you know, to, to your attention that this is something that we all must weigh in on and, and seriously consider what can be done to handle um, these situations and how to better handle um, kids who are just not able to properly manage their own emotions. You know, what can be done about it? And again, that takes time. And it takes the resources that I think we're trying to enhance and put in place in the school so that we have the right people working with the students because it is about changing behavior. It's not about putting the kids out. We need our kids to be in school, but we also need to teach them the right way to behave in the school or outside in the world, in the community. So those are the things that we're really trying to work on and enhance the resources available and wraparound services, not just for the students, but also for the families. And that's part of the reason that we're bringing in extra resources into our building and looking to use some of those state funds to maybe even enhance that further. I think the resources, the community resources that we can use, the wraparound services for families, all of that, it's going to take time, but it is something that we've started and we're going to continue to work on and hopefully we'll see a change. That's, that's what we all want. Mm -hmm. so so before you go, sir, I'll add something to your to this point. And I've 
I've got very little educational experience, and my experience has been law enforcement for my entire adult life. We've learned over the last 20 years that we can't lock ourselves up out of a problem. So in order to ensure that we're doing the best that we can, we've seen criminal justice reforms that have been long overdue for many years. And that we have to learn kind of some of the same things inside of our schools. And our community issues come into our schools. And our issues from inside of our schools also go into our communities. So this is a community issue. It's a national issue. There are a tremendous amount of rules and laws that many people are not aware of that, that the school systems are bound by. I'm the security guy, as I was kindly referred to as, and I'll tell you that one of the biggest things that we have to look at with security is the discipline issues with inside of our school. It needs to be fair, it needs to be consistent, it needs to be equitable. However, when, it's, it, when it becomes individual issues, it never feels that way. And this is an issue that we'll continue to struggle with for many years, but with parents, like the number of parents that are here today, I still firmly believe that we have about 98% of our population that are reasonable and logical and that are raising wonderful kids. And we can help those other two, but by throwing them out of school to hang out in the streets isn't the answer. So trying to figure out how those balances work, and that's where we're at. Is, and I think what you're seeing from this group of people and the amazing educators that we have inside of this system is a desire to get to that balance. We've had an entire generation at times in different places in this country that have been thrown away kids, and we can no longer do that. Any other questions from the audience that's here with us tonight? Okay, while, while those folks are heading up to the mic, I'm gonna add another Twitter question. Why do teachers have to complete volunteer training if they volunteer on a school trip at their child's school? So this is a current employee teacher. Why do they then have to go through the volunteer training for a school trip at their child's school? Um, and I am the reason for that. Uh, and uh, the reason that that is, is because as it sits right now, as uh, Ms. Majors has pointed out, there is an ongoing discussion and I would encourage everyone to read. It is the Federal Credit Reporting Act that was passed that requires us to abide by many different rules as it relates to conducting backgrounds on our employees. Um, and one of the things is, is since we cannot, at this point, we have not come to a resolution about continuing to do random and ongoing background checks of our employees. Some of our employees that, are, that also have students that, are, that want to volunteer, we are asking and requiring that they do undergo the social security based background because we have not done that in many years and we're just, it's, a, it's closing of a gap that we've identified. I want to thank the superintendent and the panel who are having this um, gathering tonight for the parents in the community. Uh, my son is in the ninth grade. He's um, attending Westlake High School. Um, he is formerly a homeschool student. And this is his, uh, not his first experience in Charles County Public Schools, but um, certainly to high school. And at this very moment, he's out on the football field uh, having football practice. Now my question uh, does not have to do with the perimeter security, that is my first question, but it does have to do with medical emergency protocols. And that has to do with uh, heat related trauma that could be experienced by any of our student athletes who are out on the field. I don't know if anyone um, might be parents of uh, students who are practicing on the football field this summer, but a couple of days ago, there was an incident where two of the students were overcome by the heat and they were taken away to the hospital in an ambulance. Um, I did approach the coach afterwards because my wife and I are very concerned about this, um, as any young man would be very enthusiastic about playing football. Um, but what I was uh, trying to find out is the types of training and the uh, certifications for uh, staff members for uh, medical emergency protocols 
I did note that at the beginning of the uh, season, the practice season, that Maryland State had um, implemented a number of protocols for head trauma. But as we learned recently in the news, there was a young student who succumbed to a heat-related emergency at the University of Maryland. And so my question is, um, how can uh, medical emergency protocols be enforced, uh, be monitored, and also to uh, have uh, medical devices available inside the gymnasium or on the field, or if, if that is not already a part of the protocol. And I have one other question after that. Okay, so I'll get started and then anyone would like to First of all, we share your concern. And the reason that I believe your son is practicing now rather than practicing earlier this afternoon was because of the temperatures and the humidity outside today. So we have a coordinator of student activities mm -hmm. who monitors weather conditions and, and temperature and humidity and that sort of thing and sends out um, messages to our athletic directors, our school-based athletic directors, as well as anyone else who is sponsoring an activity that may be outdoors on days where it is inappropriately hot and it is inappropriate to have kids outside then we limit or curtail completely those activities. In the case of an, a sport like football, this evening he is only wearing shorts and a helmet, right? They're not in full pads. Because of the requirements of protecting our kids from uh, overheating, the incident at University of Maryland was tragic. And the incident yesterday at the Westlake football practice where the two young men had symptoms of heat exhaustion um, was handled, I thought, very well. Our coaches are trained, our athletic directors are trained. We have required intervals of break, water break. Students can only have activity for X number of minutes and then they have to have a water break. Even our um, scrimmages that are scheduled this time of year that are outdoors, <clears throat> the officials are instructed that after so many minutes of activity, there needs to be so many minutes of break to ensure that our kids are safe. Uh, we also have athletic trainers who are uh, contracted to participate with our teams and with our coaches and our ADs to help educate kids and coaches about the signs of heat exhaustion, head injury. We do um, heat, what is that called, Accl acclimation, yes. where the kids coming out into a, a, a season like this one in the fall where they have so many days of practice where they're very limited in what they can do until they are adjusted to the outdoor environment. So we do a lot and we want to make sure that our kids are, are safe when they're out on the fields. Um, have I forgotten anything? Mr. Heim, you're very experienced with athletics. I'm pretty far removed from coaching at, at a school, but uh, you've talked about training for coaches. One of the things that our coaches have to go through a class, it's care and prevention of injuries. So they talk about the care and prevention of you know, minor injuries, but a major part of that now focuses on concussions and working with the trainers to help diagnose uh, symptoms of a concussion, but also working with this heat acclimation period. And as Dr. Hill was saying, our coordinator of student activities, Mr. Steve Lee, uh, he works with the uh, surrounding district, St. Mary's and Calvert, uh, but there's a, a, a I don't want to know the word I'm looking for, a formula that they use when looking at the temperature and the humidity and those combined together. So that's when we put out those messages to our, our coaches and the uh, you know, athletic trainers and also to the athletic directors. So today I believe the time period was from 11 o'clock a.m. till 7 o'clock p.m. There could be no outside activities due to the combined heat and humidity. Uh, and there are you know, state uh, policies in place dealing with concussions and that heat acclimation period. So. Actually, in the past, the fall season wouldn't begin till October 15th, but that season now begins earlier, so those sports can go through the procedures that are in place for this, dealing with the heat and humidity in, in early August. What was your second question? Yes, if I could just stress a little bit on that first question. question. Um, how should parents address what they might believe to be breaches of the protocols that could put their children at risk, such as uh, not uh, allowing for the appropriate times for hydration or rest or the proper hours. Um, one of the things that I was, uh, I'll say thankfully uh, informed of, was the proper diet to prepare 
uh, an athlete for the, the daily training. Um, and I understand that a nutritionist is going to be available to address uh, some of those practices, but that's not going to be until well or farther into the season after the exposure to the heat-related uh, trauma risk is already in place. Um, but how to address uh, sure. a breach of the protocol? If, if you have a concern, the first step is to address it with the head coach. And then if you're not satisfied with the response you get from the head coach, then you address it with the athletic director. And if still you have concerns beyond that, then you address it with the principal. Perfect. And then my other question is had to do with the perimeter security. And again, my only experience is there at the gym while the guys are in football. But uh, the security officer did mention that uh, the, the doors to the building should be closed. It may not be the fault of the staff that the doors are left open to the weight room because there's no air conditioning on. But if we're going to enforce those types of perimeter restrictions, maybe there should be contingencies in place to allow for that or to uh, more forcefully restrict those, uh, enforce those, uh, the locks on the doors and the doors being closed. Especially in the summertime, we may not expect or it may not be at a high risk time for that type of uh, event to take place, but that was one of my concerns. That's, that's all I have. Thank you. Are you aware of an air conditioning problem at the, in the weight room at Westlake? I'm going to assume what we have summer. We have summer hours uh, we run during the summertime. Uh, so beyond uh, 3 30 in the afternoons uh, we will turn down air in parts of buildings that are not being used uh, so if a part of the building is being used beyond those summer hours because normally schools there would be nobody in the building after 3 30 and we do that uh, for a number of reasons and one of the things is for you know conserving energy but there's a policy in place for the building service manager if informed by the athletic director and the coach that there are events going on in parts of the building we can control heating and cooling in parts of the building without having on an entire building. And the, the oh, where'd you go? There you are. So, so the piece that I would disagree with you on is you said something about maybe not being the fault of the staff. I would disagree with you there. If, if I am the PE teacher or if I am running a weight room and I'm propping those doors open and not monitoring or supervising them, then that is my fault. And that's a message that we need to send in a more direct way to our staff you know, they think they're doing the easy thing and, the, and helping out each other, but propping open doors is a thing of the past, and it shouldn't be happening. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Nicole Kramer, and I've, I have three children, one who graduated, two who are still in the school system. So I have a great interest, obviously, in, um, you know, the safety of the schools. Um, and I'm glad that you had this forum tonight because it's really needed. Uh, and I just want to say, you know, it's a it's great to hear about the comprehensive plans that have been put in place to protect um, the safety and security of the schools. Um, but what I noticed is that a lot of it talks about keeping sort of outsiders out and people who don't belong in the school out, which is great. And we need that and covering all bases. Um, but what I don't hear a lot about is, you know, protecting students or the staff from dangers from individuals who are permitted to be in the school. So as we know, a lot of the school shootings happen from students who go to that school. So what are we doing to help prevent those types of things from happening from people who belong in the school? So giving your ID at the door or any of that stuff is not really gonna matter because they belong there. Um, so like, what's your, your um, thought security guy on like, um, <laughs> sorry, just fits, right? It's fitting uh, on like metal detectors in the schools. I know we don't want to like create, the, you know, a fortress, but other, other communities do it, other counties do it. And if that's what works, I'm all for it. So what's your, you know, thoughts on that? So thank you for your question. And I, I did anticipate the metal, de metal detector question coming. Um, so there are, um, and I think Mr. Heim and um, doc, Dr. Hill can attest to this, we had a discussion that lasted about three and a half hours on just how to put door locks on doors. There is nothing simple as it relates to this. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of people that are out there that are saying a lot of different things on a lot of different news medias and they're planting a lot of different seeds. There's a couple things, and we have some experts that sit with us on, this, on the Parent Advisory Council that deal with metal detectors and that deal with things such as airports and deal with things at, at the Smithsonian. 
Schools are not airports, and they're not, Smithsonian, they're not the Smithsonian Institutes. Um, right before we came in, I was doing some research, and uh, uh, some of the things that I found, the flow rate, as Mr. Carbone, one of our, one of our, uh, our, our volunteers that helps us, will tell you, at any metal detector is about 160 to 200 people per hour at an optimum level. That means that if we would put, in, in order for metal detectors to work and for, to not be a false sense of security, let's say, we'd have to put them at every door, at every school, and they'd have to be manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They are a solution, but they are not the solution. We are not to that point to where we believe that that is what's needed. We think that we can start with policies and procedures. We think that we can look at things such as we're currently in talks with the state fire marshal's office about how to sec better secure and barricade our doors for the schools that have doors. Um, believe me when I tell you the state fire marshal's office is the most powerful office in, this, in the state. Um, and simply putting barricades or these fire hose things or whatever else around doors to lock doors is not that simple. However, I'm glad to tell you that we are making quick progress on possibly being one of the first places that gets approval for a system that's out there. So we are looking at ways to more quickly and better barricade our doors and to make them more safe. I am a firm believer in a layered approach. I kind of, you, you kind of have to look at security like an onion and every layer that you can establish, the better off that you're going to be. There is no one solution. We can put, as Dr. Hill was talking about, we can put metal detectors at every door, an armed police officer and a security guard at every door, and the first child that sees somebody walking up with a guitar case and a book in their hand and says, let me help you out, and opens the door, we've defeated all of those procedures. Mm -hmm. So it is, we, we are trying to take a layered and comprehensive approach. We're not throwing anything off the table, but for our school system, metal detectors are not where we're going because when you look at the, the work, and there's no scientific data that they work. There's a lot of communities that have tried them and abandoned them. Um, so as many that use it are also abandoning it. So there's no, there's no one solution out there that will fix, that will fix this. Hey, let me interrupt for just a minute, security guy. Yes, ma'am. I appreciate your question because it's something we've thought about over and over and over again because you're exactly right. In some of these major school tragedies, the perpetrator has been a student who just flowed in with all the other students. Two things. Uh, one is that I, uh, I meet regularly with the Student Advisory Council at the high school, middle school, and elementary school levels. And one of my high school Student Advisory Council members had been a student in DC schools where there were metal detectors. And so we got to talking about school safety shortly after the Parkland tragedy. And in the general conversation, metal detectors came up and she said, they don't work. I've been in a DC school and I went to school the entire year and I never once passed through the metal detector. And the school folks thought we're safe because we have these metal detectors there. The other layer that uh, Mr. Stoddard was referring to that we are counting on is a lot of times the profile of those folks who are going to come in and do horrific things in schools are kids who are loners, kids who are suffering through mental illness issues, kids who show signs somehow that they may be a threat. So we're developing a local school-based threat assessment team, mm -hmm. which contains psychologists and other experts <coughs> to be able to look at that. And we're also counting on our see something, say something tool that your children and your children and your children, if you see or are aware or hear whispering about something that you think may be going on, we need all of your ears and eyes, all of us together to every layer that we can cover, we're going to cover to avert that kind of thing happening. And here's the last thing that I'll add, because this is an important topic that continues to come up. The Secret Service did a study that started in 2000 and they just revamped it and, read, and, and put out some additional data. 80% of school shooter, when school shootings happen, over 80% of them someone knew was coming and only 20% of the documented cases or roughly 20% of the documented cases that they could find did that person pass that information on to any higher authority that could do anything to prevent the tragedy. Those are the immediate issues that will stop this and that will greatly reduce this. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, sir. 
Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Ken Shelton. And uh, I want to say, you know, thanks to Charles County and the um, Superintendent of Education for putting together this forum for allowing the communi community to communicate the concerns um, that, uh, that we all have about school safety and security. And with that, I have a few questions. Um, one of the first slides that was presented, it had a statement about um, a training that was being carried out throughout the school system. It was options-based active shooter response training. I just, uh, for the life of me, I just can't figure out what that really means. So what we used to do was we would train all of our, all of our teachers when there were, was an active shooter or a dangerous situation to lock down in their classrooms, move to a place away from visible, away from a, a window in the in the door or or the exterior, keep their students quiet and hide. That is not the current way to handle situations like this. So Mr. Stoddard has come in and done a lot of research on what the most appropriate training is now, and we've retrained all of our staff. And I'm going to ask him to please kind of give an overview of what we're asking our staff to do at this point. So there's a there's a number of different companies that have trademarked many different things that I won't give uh, trademark credit to today, but we've taken the best best practices approach. The Department of Homeland Security has been teaching run, hide, fight for many, many years. So what we did is we, we evolved that training after reviewing things like Parkland and what happened at Great Mills and what happened in Annapolis, what happened in Virginia Tech and to look at all those tragedies and say, what actually happens? So the one thing that we wanted to pass to our staff, that we are passing to our staff, is empowering them to make decisions with the information that they have. Whether that information comes from a PA system or it comes from what they see or what they hear. There is no, once again, one solution to this. Not every one of our schools has doors <clears throat> on the inside. So what we want is we've gone completely away from code words. The time to keep secrets is not when people are inside of our schools doing tragedies. So we've made it plain English of what we're going to tell our staff. And with that information that comes across, that information is going to be passed and the staff is going to make the most appropriate decisions based on the location of the event or what they hear or what they feel. We're also um, moving to the fact that lockdowns are not the only option. The Department of Homeland Security has been teaching <laughs> run, hide, fight in that order for a reason. The optimal option, if given the, if given the availability to do, has always been to run. Because statistically, running and hitting a moving target, if you were armed with a gun, is harder to do. But there's always the what ifs. There's always, well, what if this and what if that? And we recognize that. And that's why we're empowering our teachers to make the best decision that they can with the information that they have. We didn't take the lockdowns away. The lockdowns are still there. They're still an option. The fight is still there and still an option. However, we've evolved with the, with the threat because at no other time in American history have we seen the threat against our educational environments be as complex and as complicated as it is today. And just like anything else, if we're still doing the same things that we did 20 years ago, we're not doing it right. And we have to evolve. that you provided, who, uh, who makes the decision whether to run, to hide, or to fight? And um, is that passed on to the, to the students? Do they make that decision themselves? Does the, does the teacher make that decision? So, so a couple things that I, that I think are important that as we talk about this, school shootings are ex still extremely rare. They are extremely rare, and there's statistics out there that show that they're actually reducing in number, which is a wonderful thing. However, they drive policy, and they drive procedures, and they are every parent's fear. I have three kids ranging from 21 to 3. Anybody want to have that conversation? <laughs> so I understand what you're saying. The decision, if you're a parent right now, because of everything that we've faced, we're having to struggle with how do we talk to our children about this threat. And many parents are telling their kids, if you can run, run. So that ha so the decision based on what we're, what do, we're not there to argue at that point. And many parents are telling their kids to do that. We're passing the information down. We're decentralizing that decision making to the people that can make those decisions. Because we can't drive those decisions from a central office. It's possible. Yeah, they're going to be in the decision chain. There is no doubt. Okay. And that makes sense. But my wife's an educator, 
and uh, she has direct concerns about some of the policies and procedures that are in place here in Charles County. And from the presentation that was presented, I didn't see anything that was directed directly towards North Point High School where my student attends. And I was just wondering what type of uh, renovations are being considered for North Point? Um, are, are, or are there any renovations? So, so North Point has a lot of wonderful things going for it in the way that it's designed, the fact that it's new. It it's, has the luxury of having many different locks on doors that it already has the way that it's built. If your wife did not receive the information that she needs, please have her reach out to me. I don't, want any, I don't want anybody to ever go away from any of the presentations that we did the other day confused or having any questions, especially about a topic like this. And if we need to readdress that, we will. Um, however, we are constantly evaluating what we can do to improve the student safety across our entire system. So um, what I can tell you is, is that if there's things that we need to do, and we're always listening, we're always evolving, we're always want to do the best that we can, because no parent should ever have to worry about dropping their kid off from school and worry about whether they're actually going to pick them up that afternoon. And we, at the 4,000 employees of this organization, share that goal. So if there's things that we need to do, we want to listen. Okay. Well, I have a whole list of questions, and I, I feel pretty bad about just going through the whole list right now, uh, where I think I could probably email someone on this panel and just get direct answers. Um, but before I leave, um, I still have one other concern. So you said that prior to the school starting, it was 95% of the school staff was trained in this, some of these new safety and security procedures. So what's the plan for, for capturing the other 5%, which I guess, you know, unless your child is under that 5%, it really doesn't. So, so let me clarify that. Um, what I meant by that was there's always people that are on leave. There's always people that are sick. There's always people that were at a football game or at a scrimmage or were at training or doing things like that. So I didn't want to come in here and say, 100% of our staff was trained in it because we can't say okay. that. Right. So that's what I meant by that. Okay. The, the number is closer to 99% and we're doing follow-up sessions. Um, believe me, um, I have been in about every school this week and every, every, doing as much training as we possibly can and we're going to offer follow-up sessions to those things. And that includes food service, building service, bus drivers, nurses, every category of, of employee that has come back to work has been given access to this training. New hires that we're hiring now will have an opportunity to get caught up on this training as well as the Center for Children yeah. training that we did last year in helping to recognize signs of sexual abuse. Well, I can say, just reading from being here and listening to this, listening to some of the questions from, from the community, I, it occurs to me that safety and security in today's educational landscape is very complex and I can appreciate what's, what's being done. And, uh, and I, I think that if we can continue to do this, we can continue to be proactive and just kind of uh, refortify what we've already done and improve things moving forward. Thanks for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am Nikki Goodland. I have a student at Barry Elementary, um, which is one of the very overcrowded schools. I believe there's gonna be uh, 30 children in her classroom, which is a lot to ask of any teacher, um, much less in a crisis. Um, she is going to be in her second year in a module. Um, she was there last year when she was a fourth grader. They're putting her back in a module this year as a fifth grader. I am completely uncomfortable with it. Um, I hated it last year. I hate it this year. Um, there's really nothing to secure the ground that it's on. It's not in a secure build building. They may be able to lock a door, but um, my concern, of course, is that the, the modules are vulnerable. There's nothing to stop anyone from walking up to a module, unlike the doors of the school. Um, I spoke to the principal about it. He said there is a resource officer that's shared between Barry and Madeline. That's one resource officer for two schools. Um, there is basically no one out there. There's a camera, but that's very after fact, as you said. You can review it after you've lost your child. Um, I don't wanna wait for that. What efforts are being made to, if you can't get more officers to secure the grounds, 
um, what type of efforts are you making to make sure that people can't just walk up to the modules, shoot through them? Um, it's not a brick building. It is, I'm sure, easily pierced. Like, my child is vulnerable. I'm not comfortable with it. I don't feel like she's secure there. Um, and I don't feel like there's enough effort being made. Is there outreach? You have all this, you know, social security background checks. Reach out to the community. Get some retired police officers. Have them tour the grounds. Eyes there. Get some more eyes. Some, some people you can trust. Make the effort to reach out to the community. I'm not from here. I'm from Ohio. This is the most isolated I've ever felt in a community anywhere. There's not a community center. You said that the people who do it are loners. Probably come from an atmosphere like this. There's no community centers. They're all spread out. There's no community. So you won't get to know that, hey, so-and-so is kind of an outsider here because he's in his house all day. There's nothing to bring him out. There's nowhere for kids to kind of interact with each other freely. I pay for my daughter to interact. I pay for her to go to soccer. I pay for her to do gymnastics. I pay for her to interact because there's no kid goes to the park. How many children you see out there? There's no interaction, which makes them antisocial. They don't learn social skills. They don't learn social cues. They don't learn how to build relationships because there's no free interaction around here. What outreach are you, efforts are you making? First of all, thank you. Thank you. Um, we share your concern. Barry is very overcrowded, and I think that's something that we all recognize. Um, we, I, I am a little um, dismayed by the, the comments you're making about us being so isolated from each other. I don't think what you said is untrue, but I think that what you said about being isolated from each other is something that we can all work on together. It's not something the school can solve by itself. It's not something that the community can solve by itself. But certainly, we all need to work on getting our own selves away from our devices and getting our children away from devices so that they do learn those social skills that you talked about. You're very eloquent in describing, I think, some issues that many families are facing today. Uh, regarding the modular buildings, Mr. Heim talked about the safeguards we have put in place. Beyond that, Mr. Stoddard, you said you had uh, some yeah. comments. So, as as I think everybody, and 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 thank you. There's a there's a there's obviously a tremendous amount of stress as it relates to this, and there are no easy answers in overcrowding and people coming to our wanting to live in our community that provides a great educational experience and all those other things. There is help on the horizon with a new elementary school that's going to come that I think could help this, but it won't help this this year. Yeah, there was a lot of a lot to unpack there, a lot of great ideas, but there's some ideas that, you know, that, that this body, as far as police officers, we don't we don't have that control. I would we don't hire them, they don't work for us and things like that. Um, as far as putting um, extra police officers, retired police officers in our schools, that's always something that every school system is looking at, but it's not something that we would take lightly. As far as securing and physical security of the mods, you're right, they're not perfect, they're not ideal, and quite frankly, that we don't want them either. Um, and we're trying to do everything that we can to ensure that we don't, but we have them. So that's the reality that we live in. Um, and to do, to the, the security upgrades that we can do to them, we're trying to do everything that we can. You're right, we can't build a brick structure around them. There's not a temporary brick structure that we can put around them. Well, we can look at the high fence, and I will tell you that through the, through the commissioners, they have looked at, we have looked at fencing. However, the fencing issue can also be an issue on the other end of that. It can hamper response and slow response. So balancing all of that is difficult. And the stress is not only it's on you, but it's also on us. And we are trying to do everything that we can. If there's one thing that I hope everybody's heard, both in person and in the Twitter world, um, is that everyone that sits here is, is, is very concerned about every level of security that we can. Now, I will tell you that please come talk to me afterwards or talk, call me on the phone and I'll meet you or whatever else, just like I would anybody else. 
I'm going to go out and look at some of those mods with Mr. Heim and Mr. Heim's team, and maybe there's some additional things that we can find that we can do. And I'll meet over here with Mr. Sotomayor, and we'll see what we can come up with. But, and I'm sure there, there's some additional layers that we may be able to come up with. So leave here knowing that it is something, and it's obviously a concern for many people here, that we are going to look at it and continue to evaluate, and there's always new solutions that are coming out there. One of the things that I'll proudly tell you that we're exploring is panic alarms, because that's important. It's important to be able to communicate. It's important to be able to do those things. We're looking at as technology, te technological solutions that we can put in different places to allow people to be safe and to feel more safe. So I know it's not the answer that you want, and we'd love to tell you we're demolishing them all tomorrow and putting all the kids inside, but that's not reality. What, where can I look for the updates to that? Where you come, what ideas you come up with after you review these modules? Yeah. And please keep in mind with the modular classrooms, this is a, an option, a viable option that is approved by the state and is actually funded by the state. So you also have to keep in mind that just like Charles County, there are 23 other school systems that are going to the state for renovations, new school construction, and the state has a limited pot of money just like the, the local government does. And this is a program that is sanctioned by the state. As I mentioned, the state has modular facilities which they give to the school systems. Ideally, the state would not like you know, to have to put modular buildings at the local school systems, but there's an issue with Charles County and a number of other school systems that you cannot keep up with with the enrollment growth, plus also the process that is in place. Before you get that state funding, you have to justify not only at that school, but the surrounding schools that you have enough population to build a, build a new school in order to get back, get rid of those, those modular buildings. But yes, we would like to have no trailers in Charles County, uh, but it's not a quick, easy fix, and there are rules, procedures from the state that we have to follow, and some of those rules and procedures uh, for the short term, you know, put those, place, put those modular buildings in, in place. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Tony Phoebus. I'm a retired military member. I'm also a cybersecurity workforce member. My question is, it's being a dead horse, but what is Charles County doing to address the issue of gang activity that uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland is dealing with, such as MS-13 and or the neo-Nazi problem we currently have uh, in our current state of our uh, country? So that was one of the uh, topics of your all-hazard meeting the other day, um, working with other agencies. Mr. Stoddard is staying up to date on that and keeping us up to date on that. I don't know how much you can share so, in this forum. Uh, my, predecessor, my, my previous job was in charge of our Homeland Security and Intelligence Unit, and that uncovered our gang units. And there is no doubt that there are gangs in Charles County. There are validated gang members in Charles County. Um, and we are working hand in hand with my partners. Um, specifically the new commander of the Homeland Security and Intelligence Unit at the Sheriff's Office to ensure that the information sharing pipelines are as open as they possibly can be. We, our school resource officers provide different curriculums that are anti-gang curriculums. We are looking at different things that we can do inside of our schools, working in partnership with our SROs and with the Sheriff's Office as a whole and with the Maryland State Police and the other uh, organizations that do, that the FBI, the ATF, um, to ensure that we're staying on top of things. The one thing that you'll find, the commonality with, with other jurisdictions that have experienced horrific tragedies that relate to gang activity is they were behind it because they didn't want to see it. Here's what I'll tell you about Charles County. We're in front of it and we're doing the best that we can, trying to learn from the other organizations that are out there that have experienced extreme problems with gangs, with, as you said, um, the neo-Nazi movements and things like that. When we're able to stay in front of it and prevent it and do preventative measures, respond to the, the few, the, truly the actual few events that we do have that are gang related, then we're ahead of the game. And we've learned lessons from other jurisdictions in the national capital region and the Baltimore region to do the best that we can to keep our community at large safe. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Yes, 
Yes, sir. Good evening. Uh, thanks so much. Um, my question is about um, violence and uh, on school buses. What can be done about that? I know you guys have cameras on buses. Are uh, implementing a system for that? Um, uh, how can you enforce, uh, reinforce discipline on school buses moving forward? Mr. Hines? Sure. So just like as we talked about with <clears throat> within the school, the first step is making sure that we have preventative measures in place. And you know, again, when we talk about giving students options, uh, one of the you're fine. You're fine. Keep it on. You know, one of the difficulties in you know comparing a bus to a classroom or in a hallway is that that teacher, the, the teacher or the administrator who's on cafeteria duty or who's in the hallway between classes, their focus can be on and they can be looking at the, the, at the students. The difficulty with, with bus drivers is that they have to maintain behavior management on the bus, but they also have a focus of having to make sure that they are driving and operating that bus safely uh, in amongst all the traffic we have in you know, various parts of the, the county, especially in the Waldorf area. Uh, so we have put a plan in place with uh, emergency services that we have bus radios on the bus and the, the, you know, the, the past use for that was if they had a fight on the bus, they were informed to pull over and do what they had to do to stop that fight. Also called the transportation office. At that point, we would send out someone from the school and someone from the sheriff's department if needed. What we've done now is we've given the communication center uh, under collaboration with, with Jason when working with them, uh, access to our bus radio so we can get a quicker response to those ev events. But I'm going to be honest, just like in the classroom or in the cafeteria, and you know, I was a former teacher and administrator, if two kids are going to determine to fight, and I've had it as, you know, as an administrator where I was standing in the hallway and all of a sudden two kids fight. If two kids are determined to fight, they're going to fight. But what we try to have to do is you know, talk about the options to try to make sure that kids don't want to do that. But we have to have in place you know, the consequences when that happens. Uh, we do have the, the bus cameras, but again, that's not always a deterrent, uh, but it is helpful in, in investigation. Uh, but also with those cameras, there is uh, voice audio to that as well. Uh, but it, it, you know, our drivers have a very difficult job because they're placed in being in charge of 45 kids, in some cases a few more students, uh, who have to maintain the control of that bus with behavior, but also making sure they're controlling that bus you know, as they're dealing with, with traffic and making sure that they're following safety and protocols while they're driving. So, uh, and, and I'll unfortunately say it, you know, kids know that and sometimes will take advantage of that situation because they, they know that they are away from the school and there's not as many staff uh, to quickly respond to, to stopping an event like that. Uh, but again, with you know, some of the steps we put in place with uh, the communication center and being able to have a quicker response uh, where the drivers can have an open mic with uh, 911 and responding and giving the details of what's occurring on the bus. So we have a discipline matrix that the transportation department shares with all schools and they have a meeting uh, before school begins with all the bus coordinators, vice principals who handle school bus issues and, and bus discipline. So it's a guide uh, and it has you know, various things that may occur on the bus and the steps that should be taken uh, to try to prevent those things from happening. Uh, but again, part of that is just trying to be proactive and prevent those things from happening but to inform students that if these things do happen, this is what's going to happen. So yes, if there's a fight on the bus, I would surely hope, and that's part of the discipline matrix, that that student or students involved would be removed from the bus for a period of time. Thank yes. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. Um, first, I just want to say thank you for addressing the background checks earlier. That was actually one of my questions, and I like that you're looking into the rotating. I understand you have the legal issues, but you know, when you look at other organizations, federal, where they have to do recurring security checks, I appreciate that you're looking into that. Um, my other question is actually uh, going to be directed at the technology uh, coordinator here. So one of the things that's bothered me, I'm in, I'm in the IT industry, um, and so I'm very big about, you know, security and passwords and logins, and it bothers me that my child's login is, like, very simple for the systems. It's like, you know, you know a couple of numbers that they use everywhere. What, and I understand that with younger children, it's harder to get them to use more complex technologies. I'm hoping with the use of some ID card, you can do multi-factor or such, but I mean, have you looked at trying to, you know, do things like, you know, teaching kids passphrases or things like that, that are simple to remember, but 
can protect their information because you know they're getting access to their Office 365 and these other systems, and you know there's there's important information there that we want to start teaching these kids not to have leaked out to others. Most certainly. Thank you for your uh, question. We actually, as in January, we actually did do that. We changed okay. all of the students' passwords right. to right. make them more obscure. It, it, before, the teacher's feedback to us was that it was harder for the younger kids to remember. Understood. So we made them more simple, like zebra with a number. And certainly, we had feedback that us, uh -oh that a student was able to kind of guess the nomenclature of what we set up. So we did change, all, at effective January, we changed that. And they're now obscure. Uh, we will work with teachers if students are having issues, but mm -hmm. we did. And that was also through our cybersecurity audit to do that and even looking at changing it where staff have to change it more frequently. Right. But thank you for that. And we did well, address actually, that. want to change less frequently and use multi-factor. <laughs> <Most>, exactly. <laughs> um, so definitely, look, we did do that in January. Right. Okay. I, I missed that. I wasn't aware of that. So thank you. Yes. And we actually, we just printed out all the new passwords today. <laughs> We're working very hard today. Um, and we packaged and sorted all those. To, they'll be going to the schools, um, so they'll be getting a new password soon. So right. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, one, one thought for you too is, I mean, especially to bring your own device and older kids, mm -hmm. you know, teaching them to use password applications, right? Yeah. So, my, you know, being a technology guy, my 11 year old has his own phone, and so, you know, he has his own password app, and, you know, right. he knows how to use it. So. So we are past 8.30 and we promised to, to be finished by 8.30. I, I don't, can't let you leave without saying this. We have the responsibility to make sure that our schools are the safest places that they can be. And while you may not always agree with every decision that we make or understand the reasons behind those decisions, I don't want you to ever doubt the commitment of this team and every person who works in Charles County Public Schools to keep our children safe. Because most of us at one time or another either had a child in, pub in Ch Charles County Public Schools or has had a child in, public in Charles County Public Schools. And we want to treat your children like they're our children. So we appreciate that you share your children with us. We appreciate your questions and your ideas. And we will continue to have forums like this where you can share your questions and your concerns and your ideas with us. Because only if we're all working on the same page are we going to make sure that we can prevent any tragedy that's heading our way. So thank you for being here. Thank you for, for hanging in here with us. And we look forward to the opening of schools in a couple of days. There's no music. There's always music at the end.